official title of my talk, okay? Uh, Antiprotons for dark matter, and I added a question mark. Uh, at least official in the sense that this is what you would find on the on the website. Uh, the unofficial talk title is rather uh, how to uh, deal with antiproton flux prediction uh, and cosmic ray propagation in an era which uh, is illustrated by Manuela for the case of AMS02 has changed dramatically the, the type of uh, uh, the, 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 the errors, both statistical errors and systematic errors we have to deal with thanks to a number of experiments that I have just uh, collected here uh, in a snapshots. Okay, so I will come back to that in a, in a second. So this is the broad outline of my talk. I will give a, a very uh, quick introduction to cosmic rays, a bit of history. Some of you might not be familiar with that. Uh, then in order to explain how the prediction of the astrophysical background of antiprotons is done, I should tell you something about the standard model of cosmic rays within which this is computed. And then I will uh, show you again this few percent level antiproton uh, flux measured by AMSO2, which has triggered quite an interesting uh, uh, debate in the in the literature uh, about the hints for dark matter in this uh, in this data. And uh, uh, depending on time, I will give you my uh, my take on that because we have recently started with my collaborators uh, this this problem. So uh, let me start from the introduction and uh, very, very, very historical introduction. The first hint about cosmic rays comes from 18th century, roughly, when people start realizing that, you know, there is some spontaneous discharge of uh, electroscopes, but the origin of this is not uh, actually very well understood. And it remained a, a, a sort of mystery, like an universal feature in nature, until some... Uh, uh, people took extreme measure and uh, bold moves uh, to, to go either uh, on high altitude balloon flights or in underwater like Bacini did uh, to, to discriminate between the two leading hypotheses that were elaborated at the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century. Namely, is this due to some ground radioactivity or is this due to some astrophysical uh, uh, ionizing uh, or deionizing agent? And as you well know, this was uh, settled in favor of this uh, top hypothesis. Uh, soon after, cosmic rays became actually the tool for particle physics discoveries. And for a few decades, like two or three decades, it became the uh, uh, only accelerator available uh, for, for uh, uh, people interested in fundamental constituents. For instance, the positron uh, discovery uh, by Anderson took place with cosmic rays, but also many, many other discoveries you might have heard about, you know, the, 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 the muon, the pion, the strange particles, count, lambda, uh, uh, sigma, psi, etc. All these were discovered in cosmic rays. Uh, actually, even one more particle was discovered in cosmic rays, uh, which is antiprotons. Uh, uh, the first reported antiproton event of cosmic rays this is an historical curiosity. Uh, comes from this Italian collaboration, and this is the star event uh, for which they estimate a chance probability of 4 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, although it does not allow us to exclude an accidental process, justifies interpretation in terms of some negative proton, capture annihilation. Uh, and uh, okay, this was a paper of February 1955, and in October. 55, the discovery of antiprotons at the Bevatron of Berkeley took place. This plate was later reanalyzed. In fact, this is an antiproton event. So they had discovered it. It's just that the statistics was not enough to, to, to make a strong claim. And this is a very critical time because at around this epoch, beginning of the 50s mm, till mid 50s, there was a big transition in the cosmic ray studies. Part of the community continued to do cosmic ray physics. Another part of the community moved to man-made accelerator and producing particles artificially. Uh, all of this that you might heard about from basic courses or you deal with in accelerators are actually secondary cosmic rays. These are cosmic rays produced when some primary particle hits some molecule or atom in the atmosphere, 
there is a shower which is generated of secondary particles. You have electrons, positrons, muons, pions, blah, blah, blah. And these are the particles that we were detected by S. These are the particles that discharge your electroscopes. These are the, the antiproton events, etc., etc., etc. So this was very important for cosmic ray uh, initial stage and particle physics discovery. But actually, if you are interested, as half of the community uh, in Bagnères de Bigorre uh, became interested in the astro question, namely where these particles come from, where are they accelerated, what type of objects, when, where, etc. Well, you don't care very much about this, the bottom part of this plot. You want to care about the, 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 the primordial uh, uh, event generator. And in order to do that, of course, you must go on high altitude, possibly even in space. And this is the reason why all these nice pictures I showed you at the beginning, they are high altitude balloons, they are telescopes, uh, or cosmic ray telescopes, if you wish, put on a space station or even satellites. Okay? That's the rationale of this field. Now, one thing that these experiments, only one thing that these experiments have clarified, I think, is that there is very little antimatter in the cosmic ray. Okay? By the way, historically, this was one of the few arguments uh, to convince people that there is a, 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 an asymmetry in the universe between matter and antimatter. Cosmic ray can come from far away, at least from our galaxy. So the fact that you don't see any anti-nucleus, at least for sure not with a similar abundance as nuclei, tells you that there are basically no anti-stars in the galaxy, so very little of them, okay? Uh, this was goes back to the early 70s, at least, if not earlier. Now, you have only one anti-proton every 10,000 to 100,000 protons. Hmm? This is a plot, uh, another version of the plot shown by, uh, by Manuela. Immediately, this, in the light of what I told you before, this should give you, uh, ring a bell, this gives you an opportunity for indirect dark matter searches. Why? Because in the standard scenario, WIMP, WIMPs annihilate symmetrically in matter-antimatter, huh? so you produce equal amounts of protons and antiprotons, but antiprotons are like 10,000 or 100,000 less abundant, so it's a great opportunity to look for anomalies, huh? some, some component of the of the flux of antiprotons coming from dark matter annihilation. That's the, the good news. What's the baseline hypothesis for explaining what's going on here? Well, again, the same phenomenology I just uh, presented you uh, for the secondaries of historical uh, uh, importance. Namely, we believe that this flux is fully accounted for, that's our baseline, by rare collisions of primary cosmic rays accelerated somewhere, I will mention that, where, uh, hitting the rarefied gas of our galaxy. When I talk of rarefied gas, it's really rarefied. Much, much more rarefied than anything you, you deal with in the lab. We are talking about one particle per centimeter cube. Huh? This is ridiculous. It's basically vacuum huh? for practical purposes. Still, this uh, provides sufficient target over very long time, uh, um, uh, time scales to, to, to uh, generate secondaries, just like cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere generate secondaries, and we interpret these antiprotons as the galactic counterpart of the antiprotons of Amalvi and his group that I just showed you before. That's our idea. Is this true, or there is room to be even hints here and there for another component coming directly from wind annihilations in this flux? That's the, the, the topic of my talk. Okay? In order to explain if there is any room for, for uh, uh, dark matter or, or not, I should explain how we basically quantify this baseline hypothesis and compare this qualitative theory with this data. And these data are now of quite good precision. We are talking about few percent errors huh? in the best case for antiprotons. This is unbelievable if you knew the, the old days. So let me present this cosmic ray standard model within, this within which this computation is done. Uh, the key hypothesis of the model is some sort of factorization. Okay? The problem can be factorized in terms of some source which accelerate the cosmic rays, some propagation time, huh? and some effects which are local within the solar system. Okay? And the time scales and the energy scales of these problems are very different. So you can really uh, make a, a, a factorized problem, okay? And this has more or less a fiducial uh, 
uh, model or a framework if you wish. Typically the galaxy for cosmic ray purposes is modeled like a, 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 a sandwich huh, in which the, 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 the sources, the astrophysical sources are placed in a very thin gaseous plane. The thickness of this plane is of the order of uh, maybe 100 parsec or so, embedded in a magnetized halo within which diffusion can take place. I will come uh, uh, soon to that. This model is um, actually motivated by a number of observations. For instance, here I show you uh, one uh, radio contours for one galaxy. Uh, and uh, uh, these are um, associated to, uh, to synchrotron radiation, so magnetized uh, stuff with high energy electrons. And you see clearly that this extends well beyond the, the gaseous plane of the, uh, of the stars. Okay? So this is inspiring this uh, simplified picture. Now, what about the sources? Of course, if you want to accelerate particles, you must satisfy a few criteria. First criterion, energy. Huh? The energy budget must be sufficient to provide the, uh, uh, the cosmic rays that you measure at the Earth with the, the, uh, the energy stored in there. Basically, there is only one class of object in the galaxy that can do that. And these are supernova explosions. So if roughly, you know, 10% of the supernova uh, 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 explosion uh, channeled into the kinetic energy of the remnants of the supernova, this is uh, the closest supernova uh, explosion for which we have a photographic uh, uh, record and uh, also neutrino detection. Uh, if you have enough of this energy, order 10%, channeled in the kinetic energy of these remnants that you see in uh, nice pictures on magazines sometimes, uh, well, that's roughly enough to provide uh, with the right budget for explaining the cosmic ray density, okay? There might be other contributions from pulsars, from stellar winds, but typically these are um, subleading with respect to the bulk of hadronic uh, cosmic ray energy. And here you see also some typical scale size for these remnants, 10 parsec radius or so, or, or yeah, diameter and uh, uh, some thousands or tens of thousands of kilometers uh, per second. Another criterion is the mechanism for energy transfer. Okay, uh, The most efficient way which is widespread in these objects is the so-called diffusive acceleration. You have a shock propagating outwards in this interstellar medium and uh, this is an ideal situation because particles can gain energy by, uh, by uh, scattering from uh, uh, upstream to downstream of this shock and back cyclically. Why this is the mechanism preferred uh, by most uh, theorists? First of all, because this uh, acceleration efficiency, the energy that you gain in each cycle, is first order in the shock velocity. Shock velocity is not completely negligible. You know, it's percentage almost of the speed of light. And you can repeat this again and again and again, eh, as long as the shock uh, uh, is, is uh, surviving, which happens for, say, 100,000 years. Keep in mind this time scale, 100,000 years. Uh, the spectral index is universal. It's universal for strong shocks, which means strongly supersonic shocks. The Mach number is much larger than 1. And you get something which is slightly steeper than e to the minus 2. And this is good because it's quite close to the value that you infer from observation. Okay? These are a few of the reasons why um, this mechanism is, is preferred. And there are other arguments, the confinement or the lack of significant energy losses. For those of you who are used to accelerator physics, these are, these are the same requirements that you must have in an accelerator if you don't want to lose your beam, right? So we, we have to apply the same to any astrophysical uh, object. The second step, the propagation. What happens once the particle leaves the acceleration site? Okay, let's say after 100,000 years or maybe tens of thousands of years. Well, you can quickly compare the, the Larmor radius of the particle in the magnetized galactic environment, typical magnetic fields in the galaxy are micro Gauss uh, strength, uh, with the typical distances uh, to, to uh, typical galactic distances. And you find out that actually the Larmor radius uh, is of the order of a parsec, even for particles as energetic as PV. Okay? This means that typically uh, your, your particle will lose track of uh, initial direction very, very quickly while propagating over galactic distances. So you do expect already from this simple uh, calculation that the actual motion of the cosmic ray in the galaxy is like Brownian motion. Huh? It changes direction every, every 
uh, parsec or so for a PV or even be, uh, a fraction of a parsec, like a milliparsec or so for a PV particle. And this is much, much shorter than the kiloparsec size it has to, uh, to cross. So you know how to describe this macroscopically, right? It's a diffusion type of process. So macroscopically, you have a continuity equation for the, for the density and the flux. And then the, the current uh, 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 is related to the, to the gradient of the, of the flux through a fixed law. And essentially, the proportionality constant is the, uh, is the diffusion coefficient. Okay? So far, so good. There is one difference that the diffusion of cosmic rays in the galaxy is not like the Brownian motion in uh, from the microscopic point of view. The Brownian motion is really collisions of matter with matter. There is no matter with which cosmic rays uh, collide in the galaxy. Huh? Uh, uh, some of you are, um, some in the audience were at a school I uh, was teaching uh, a few weeks ago, so they should know that this calculation would lead to ridiculous uh, scales for for the for how often a cosmic ray actually uh, interacts in the in the matter of the galaxy, so the real collision is between the cosmic ray and some fluctuation in the magnetic field, or if you wish, a, a wave, an Hoffman wave, uh, uh, if you know what I'm talking about in the in the in the magnetized medium, and you should think of it like a cosmic ray surfing adiabatically the wave if the, the wavelength of the perturbation is much, much larger than the, the Larmor radius, uh, ignoring the wave, averaging it out if it's much smaller, and only being deflected if roughly there is a match between the Larmor radius of a cosmic ray and uh, the, the, the fluctuation of the wave. So the momentum dependence of the diffusion uh, of cosmic rays depends on how fluctuation are, how large they are as a function of the different scales. Okay? So that's the, uh, the idea that you, uh, you may have in mind. So once you measure this diffusion, you are actually probing the spectrum of fluctuation in magnetized uh, uh, over density. Hmm? There are still some uh, complications with respect to this picture, and these complications have essentially to do with the fact that these fluctuations in the magnetic fields are not uh, uh, static in your uh, galaxy. They are actually Alvin waves, they are propagating, and, and then you have to do a, 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 a change of frame in order to see how the physics looks like in your uh, galactic frame. And this uh, gives rise to an, a few terms, some advection. Cosmic rays can be transported with, the, with your, with your uh, plasma. Uh, adiabatic losses. Uh, 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 there might be uh, reacceleration, which is a diffusion in momentum space, blah, blah, blah. These are complications which are dealt with with ad hoc codes. I won't enter all this. Okay, so I will just try to explain you how the, 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 the logic of the, the calculation goes on. And this is the cosmic ray propagation I need for, for, for dummies, 101. Okay? Uh, the most important effect is diffusion, spatial diffusion. Huh? And you can even prove mathematically that for a stationary, homogeneous, isotropic problem, you only observe at a special location, you can basically replace your uh, spatial diffusion equation with an equivalent uh, e effective confinement time, which at steady state can be solved algebraically, and you have a simple equation that tells you that the flux of cosmic rays that you measure at the Earth is proportional to the stuff that you inject at the source times a diffusion time scale, which is in general dependent on energy. Okay? Very, very simple now. Some species, as Manuela was mentioning, are not really present in the interstellar medium. Take the case of lithium or uh, even antiprotons later on. So uh, these species are not accelerated at supernova remnants. Okay? Q is, uh, the Q uh, primary for them is zero. So these species are only present if they are produced during the propagation of cosmic rays. For them, these species are called secondaries. The, the source term is nothing but the same as the solution of this. So the source term writes like a primary flux uh, proton, say, times some cross-section for, for, well, yeah, proton impinging on, say, oxygen and producing uh, boron, okay? This would be a source term for boron uh, as a secondary species. Uh, if the diffusion and the cross-section here for these palation processes are energy dependent, in general, these are different in spectral shape, the secondary and the primary species. Okay? And 
since there are no significant antiprotons in the supernova remnants or the medium, basically antiprotons are uh, thought to be secondary. Okay? The dark matter would be a direct source of antiprotons, namely there is directly a, a, a source term here in this equation, or the equation I wrote before. The propagation parameters can be fixed, so this diffusion time scale in this simplified picture can be fixed by looking at secondaries over primaries. The most widespread measurement is uh, involving boron or a boron over carbon ratio. Uh, and uh, since the cross section for spallation has very little energy dependence above uh, uh, GV scale, basically the spectrum in uh, energy per nucleon is not altered. In, uh, in this ratio, and what you see is very close, not exactly, but close to the energy dependence of this uh, diffusion uh, time scale. You can fit to the data, the boron over carbon data, and you get uh, an information on this diffusion time scale, or if you wish, the equivalent diffusion uh, coefficient k. These are typical values that you find in the literature. For, for your understanding, the diffusion time scales we are talking about, about around a uh, few GeV, are of the order of tens of millions of years. So you see there is an acceleration for tens of thousands of years, and there is a propagation of tens of millions of years. So there is a factorization of scales here. Hmm? And at the end, these particles must go through the solar system. Huh? They must penetrate through the wind of uh, uh, particles uh, associated with, uh, uh, there is a relativistic wind, well, a relativistic, yeah, there is electromagnetic pointing flux and uh, uh, ionized material coming from the from the sun. This is an electric field that particles uh, see, so they alter their um, uh, their energy, and the very low energy ones can actually be uh, shielded from entering into the solar system. Huh? It's like an electromagnetic shield that the solar system has, and this has an effect of suppressing the the flux of cosmic rays of low energy that you see at the Earth here, a couple of orders of magnitude at very low energies. By the way, this is very important. Without this, the rate of radiation on Earth would be deadly. Uh, so maybe this is also related to the evolution of life. So far, so good. And I won't enter the details on how do you deal with that. Uh, there are prescriptions, there are models. Let's come to the protons based on this. What you compute is exactly the same thing that you do for the boron or this secondary nucleus. There is just some technical complication. Namely, the antiproton flux, assumed it's secondary, is a convolution of this propagation time scale, mostly diffusive, uh, some target density for the cross section, the cross section for antiproton production in, say, proton proton collision, proton helium collision, etc., and the flux of primaries, protons, helium, etc. Okay? This is a convolution, it's not just a product, because now, uh, of course, there is an inelasticity involved, and uh, uh, you know an antiproton of 10 GeV is actually produced by 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 a proton of uh, maybe 100 uh, or few hundred GeV. So this is really an integral uh, type of equation, but the, the the logic is the same. And you fix the propagation parameters, the blue ones, from things like the boron over carbon. Huh? You fix the source parameters from the primary species that you measure, the proton, the helium. That's the logic. And then you have some input from laboratory measurements. One example is the LHCb uh, measurements uh, with smog detector of proton helium into antiproton, huh? which enters this red piece of cross-section. You fit simultaneously the, the three parameters of this, and you end up with a prediction now for the antiprotons. OK? IMS data presented this, this uh, uh, IMS uh, collaboration presented this data. I won't enter uh, into detail. So what happened in the community once this uh, were presented? There was a very interesting analysis uh, concluding that there is a, a, a favored um, uh, hint for presence of a dark matter signal in this, um, in this data. And this is seen, perhaps, uh, in the left plot with respect to the right plot. The right plot, there is no dark matter, and their model is the, is the black curve. And you see that there is some excess in the residual. Here there is a little bump. This bump goes away in the residuals if you add some dark matter uh, contribution, which is the red, uh, the red bump. By the way, you see that when we talk about dark matter in antiprotons, even in these papers that claim there is some hint, we are talking about 10 percentage contribution. So the bulk of the antiprotons is uh, secondary as far as the community is concerned. 
Okay, there have been an, a similar uh, conclusion in this paper, and a much smaller effect, like two sigmish or so, is claimed in this other analysis. There's been a sequel in 2019 with a reanalysis by the same team that confirmed the excess. This is a much more uh, detailed investigation. There are technical improvements and checks. They confirmed the excess, but at three sigma level. A slightly different type of uh, paper was written uh, here, and they claim basically a hint of a signal at the same level as the previous paper I was mentioning of 2016. And then there is another paper whose uh, a key uh, goal is uh, applying machine learning methods to this data, but as a side product, they, they, they find a, a wide variety of significant uh, excesses or not, ranging from one sigma to a lot, depending on what you do. So this is not really conclusive to, <laughs> to, to unless you choose one uh, uh, to, to draw um, uh, a conclusion. So inspired by all that, let's say, let's check. Okay? Let's run our own analysis and let's check what we find. First step, you have to fix the, the propagation parameters. We choose the boron over carbon uh, data published by, by MS, and we add a number of technical improvements, nuclear cross-section, how you deal with, uh, with nuisance parameters, try to avoid multiplication of parameters, uh, and check consistency with primary species, uh, deal with the, the, the spectral breaks in the diffusion that Manuela was mentioning before. The major improvement is to take into account a physics-motivated models of correlation of the covariance matrix of AMS. Okay? Uh, and I will uh, spend some seconds on that. Most analysis, basically all analysis till now, but for last couple that have appeared, um, assume that the errors published by AMS are completely uncorrelated, statistical and systematic errors. Okay? This is very unrealistic. And as long as you have very large error bars for everything, everything passes into everything, it doesn't really matter what you do. At the level of precision you have, you should start worrying about these things. Okay? And what we did was to uh, follow the error decomposition uh, described uh, by AMS. Huh? So we split the systematic errors. Unfortunately, AMS02 has not passed this covariance to do something. You have to reconstruct it from the information available. So we try to do uh, our best. We split the, the, the systematic errors in number of uh, origin. You know, there is some acceptance, some scale, some unfolding, etc. And extracting from papers and, uh, and conference proceedings and interventions uh, quantitative or qualitative uh, information about the type of correlations that you have in this, okay, in energy space. For those for which we didn't have this information, we uh, use the simple parameterization of the covariance matrix with the free parameters, which is the correlation length in energy space uh, um, over which the, the data are correlated. Okay? And you fit. Once you fit this, we get a good uh, uh, description of the boron over carbon data with secondary uh, species only. These are examples of the boron over carbon in our model in three different models that differ from the physics, especially at low at low rigidity, the primaries can be uh, fitted quite uh, uh, easily with a single power law at injection. So we confirm qualitatively at least that there is this, uh, this break here is, uh, can be explained by purely diffusion effects. And we end up with a diffusion coefficient versus rigidity, which is quite well constrained at high rigidities. At low rigidities, there is a lot of dependence of all these other terms which I've been ignored, convection velocity, uh, reacceleration, etc., etc., but that's fine. Antiprotons are only produced above a threshold of 7 uh, GeV, so it doesn't really matter a lot. This, okay? So let's move to the flux uh, of antiprotons. Again, we, we recompute this flux of antiprotons, paying attention to a number of effects the contribution of nuclei up to iron, mm? not only proton, 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 helium, 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 but up to iron. Uh, taking into account the necessity to, the, to describe also the behavior of nuclei, uh, we don't want to explain the boron over carbon and, and mess up with, uh, with carbon or oxygen flux. Okay? Uh, accounting for non-prompt production, antiprotons are not only produced through direct reactions, proton-proton into antiproton. 
It can also happen that you produce a, a, an anti-heparon or a, a sigma or whatever, and it decays into an anti-proton. Uh, so you have some experimental information on that. You fold in with some theory information. So you account for that and the uncertainty on that. And then isospin violation effects. Usually you assume that proton-proton into anti-neutron and proton-proton into anti-proton have the same yield. That's not true. There is some experimental information, and we took this into account. Again, the crucial point is careful treatment of correlation of experimental and modern uncertainty. And mutatis mutandis, we use the same thing that we did for boron over carbon for anti Okay, Plus, there is some additional sources like uh, uh, the interaction, uh, cross-section related. Now, this is the prediction. This is not a fit. Huh? I insist on that. The blue curve here is a prediction no free parameters, and the black points are the data. Okay, just look at this panel. I must say that I'm, I'm quite impressed that in an astrophysical calculation you end up with something like that. Okay? So for me, this is a great success, first. However, if you look now at the residual, the difference between theory minus uh, data, well, you see that there is in fact a little bump here. Huh? So is this significant or not? What do you do normally? You compare some uh, difference between data and model, uh, 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 and you compute some chi-square with the covariance matrix, and then you see uh, uh, th what is the chi-square. The visual inspection is only doing some uh, difference over sigma. So this might be misleading. It's not exactly the same thing that you compute. Huh? And there is no model uncertainties here. I still have used a, a, a fiducial, a benchmark scenario, no model uh, error bar. If you had theory uncertainties, where do they come from? Where do they come from? They come from un uncertainties in the production cross-sections, which are basically fit to collider data with motivated parameterization. Transport parameters, the boron over carbon determination of your diffusion coefficient is not uh, error-free. And knowledge on the parent fluxes. Overall, you see that the error bar, the total error bar is this gray band, and it's not negligible at all. It's, m it's bigger, in fact, than the uh, AMS errors for all regions, but very low and very high rigidity. So forget about <laughs> doing the analysis without using theory uh, errors, because they dominate, in fact. What about the other point, the fact that you are comparing by eye and looking at this excess and not the, the, the real thing? Well, it's, it's misleading, because although these residuals seem to show a dip here, uh, already this is of the order of one sigma or so, so you shouldn't be too excited. But what actually matters is the rotated residual in a basis where these differences are diagonal, which are the ones that contribute to the chi-square. The real metric is given by your covariance matrix. Okay? If you do that and you see the residual, well, they look quite randomly distributed around your prediction. Okay? And you can quantify that can quant you can describe how Gaussian are these residuals around your, uh, your uh, uh, model. And uh, we did this with two tests, chi-square and a kolmogorov smirnov test. If you include no uh, correlation in the data, basically uh, you are very, very far off. Okay? The p-value is basically zero. There is no way uh, secondaries explain it. As soon as you include correlation, in the in the in the in the data, you have a p value of 0 0.8, 0 0.98, something like that. Forget about it. This is perfectly fine. Of course, you can add also theory errors, and you find state an agreement within one sigma, basically. Okay. So there is clearly no uh, 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 no uh, ground for claiming a, 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 an an excess uh, a significant excess. So the AMSO2 data are consistent with a secondary ori origin, as far as we can say. This is the summary plot with the error band the, uh, and, uh, and the rotated z-score. And let me say that we use relatively simple propagation scenario. Basically, these are one-dimensional. There is a one-zone diffusion. The diffusion is the same all over the galaxy. In a more realistic scenario, this is an oversimplification, of course. So the truth is that the theory per prediction is much more uncertain. There are many more parameters than matter. But if, with a simple parameter, you get that, a fortiori, this will be explained in a more complicated model. 
Let me conclude. The current cosmic ray prediction offers some new tools for dark matter searches. So I promise you a plot and we'll show you this plot. Uh, however, now we have precision data. And then great responsibility follows from great power. Okay? You must know that from clearly from study of French Revolution or more likely from Marvel. If you want to analyze features at 10% level or few percent level, unfortunately you should take care of a lot of effects. So we wrote like uh, supplemental material, <laughs> 20 pages, just to list every effect which enters at least at 1-2% level, which we have to take care of. Okay? And the most relevant thing is that for the bump-like feature which by eye uh, seems to be present in the data, fortunately this is seems to be uh, coming from, from correlated uh, errors incorrectly accounted for. Of course, we hope that the MS collaboration will, will publish this information and this will settle, hopefully, this, uh, this issue. I, it seems a very pessimistic conclusion, right? That uh, there is no dark matter and blah, blah, blah. But in fact, the fact that there is no need for dark matter doesn't mean that the constraint is not there, nor that dark matter cannot hide uh, in this uh, uh, error bar. In fact, if you tend to compute the, the, the typical constraint that you get on the cross-section versus mass, even in these papers where you have a hint of a detection, you see that the constraints of dark matter from on dark matter from antiprotons, this black part with respect to the gamma rays, are much stronger, up to the TV or so. They are uh, reaching the, the, um, uh, the thermal as wave relic uh, level, and this is true also in, 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 in other analysis. So stay tuned. Uh, uh, we are now moving to this phase where we deal with dark matter uh, uh, constraints from antiprotons, but for sure I can anticipate that these are going to be quite competitive. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. Questions? I do have one. So, <coughs> okay, so in that case it's different. So they, in the first plot they've yes. seen an axis, so it's, yes. I, it's different. So in, in your case, since you did not see an axis, then mm -hmm. your constraint will be stronger. Well, yes and no, because then it depends, you know, here uh, th there is an error bar. And uh, it all depends on how big 